brings us to today's presentation, When Twitter Turns Against the Hospital, Managing Security Events Through Hicks with Mary Devine. So Mary, I will let you share your screen now while I pull up your bio sketch and tell everyone a bit more about you. Uh, Mary Devine is the Senior Director of Emergency Management for Boston Children's Hospital. Within her role, she plans, administers, coordinates, and evaluates all activities of the Emergency Management Program. Within this position, she develops measurable performance indicators to evaluate the hospital emergency response plans and mitigation strategies. During hospital emergencies, Mary acts as planning section chief within the categories of technology, infrastructure, security, hospital surge, infectious disease, and others. Or I'm sorry, I skipped a line uh, reading the bio sketch. She's um, the planning section chief. And then regionally, Mary liaises with community agencies to develop multidisciplinary emergency management responses on the local, regional, and national ever levels. Um, there's a little bit more to her bio sketch. If you want to read that, you can find that on our website. But in the interest of time, Mary, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. You guys can see my slides, right? Just want to make sure. Yep. We can. Excellent. My name is Mary Devine, and I'm here from Boston Children's Hospital, and I'm here to talk about some security events that has been impacting the hospital since 2022. Um, I have several different types of security events we're going to talk about and how we manage that through our hospital incident command system. First things first, I do have to, oh, let me, there we go. First things first, I do have to do a little bit of a disclaimer here. Um, so this presentation is specifically intended to share best practices um, for, uh, for managing security events as experienced by the hospital. I can't comment on any care that is currently provided at Boston Children's Hospital, and I cannot comment on any active investigations that are happening um, and associated with the events that I'm going to talk about today. If you want to share this permit, this presentation, I know we're recording this, but please reach out to me or a member of my team um, to let us know if you're, you're sending this uh, outside your hospitals, especially. Okay, so today I'm just going to give a really brief background on Boston Children's Hospital. <laughs> then I'm going to go over the security events that have occurred starting uh, 2022. Um, this includes the management of harassing phone calls and emails, uh, bomb threat responses, protest responses, the institutional remediation that we've done here at Boston Children's, and then hopefully leave a little time for questions as well. Just a little bit about Boston Children's Hospital. So we are a freestanding pediatric hospital. We have 477 licensed inpatient beds. We see a lot of inpatients. We have a lot of surgical procedures. We have several different outpatient sites and eight licensed satellite sites. We do have 26,000 employees, which is a lot of employees um, based on the size of our institution, but this is also because we have a very high uh, level of research that we are associated with. Um, and we've been ranked number one and or number two last year um, on US News and World Report's best children's hospitals uh, for 13 years in a row. And I bring this up because we've been highlighted at a national level for at least 13 years. We're frequently in the news for certain things and that's really raised our profile uh, at a national level. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, different events that we've responded to in the past. Um, my presentation today is focused on uh, specific threats that were sent um, to the hospital starting in 2022, but prior to 2022, we had many different significant security events. We were attacked by the, um, the group Anonymous for a cyber attack in 2014. Um, we had several protests at our hospital from 2016 through 2019 because of a garden that we had in our in our hospital that we had to build over. Um, we have had several high profile cases that have been nationally recognized that 
that um, had security events associated with it. And uh, even as recently as last year, um, we were targeted uh, by Iranian-backed hackers um, and partnered with the FBI with this as well. So we're we're not a stranger to security events, and this is on top of everyday security events that I'm sure everybody experiences in their hospital. Um, we had many different uh, SOPs in place to deal with security issues, um, but what we were dealing with was a little bit more significant than, than what we've seen in the past. So I'm gonna go ahead, oh, okay. Let me go back. Give this one second. This is our um, background of the situation. So let's see if it goes. And it doesn't. Oh, it's taking just one second. And that's okay if it doesn't load. <laughs> this is just a news report. Oh, there we go. It's very brief. Loading now. At November 11, Boston Children's Hospital says it's being threatened right now because of lies that are spreading online. The hospital says it's being inundated with threats because of what they call misinformation about their treatment of transgender patients. They say an article online falsely claims that the hospital performs hysterectomies on minors. The age of consent for that gender-affirming procedure is actually 18. Boston Children says they're working now to protect their workers and protect their patients. So basically what happened, um, we had a an educational video with some of our gender-affirming care um, that was taken from our uh clinic specific website. It was spliced in a number of different ways. And then it was posted um, through Twitter at the time, X now, and social media platforms that posted a lot of not only misinformation, but widely spread to different um, right-wing political groups. Also, when this information was posted, a lot of uh, individuals who have a significant millions of followers posted on the um, on the post to call or send emails to Boston Children's Hospital um, to threaten them for what for the care that we provide. This was a significant disruption into our operations and started a. Uh, series of security events that we've had to deal with since 2022. Um, and the most recent bomb threat that we had was actually last week. So we continue to deal with different threats um, from different groups because of this issue. I'm not going to go in depth with this timeline of events, but our um, our activation really started in August of 2023 when we did start receiving just an overwhelming number of threatening calls, threatening emails that escalated to bomb threats the next month. Uh, the bomb threats, like I said, have continued. And then we've also had to respond to significant protests at the hospital as well. So I will, within this, con within this conversation, talk about the different strategies that we have used for each of those security events. First, I will address our, our harassing calls and email response. So in, in August, 2022, um, we had high, 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 high volumes of calls um, that were harassing, threatening, violent in nature that were going to our page operators, various clinics, um, specific staff, and also patient relations. These calls came in not only from phone calls, but also through emails. Any, any uh, public facing phone number or email address was utilized. Um, we were experiencing such high volumes that our wait times for certain clinics exponentially increased, um, as well as just our email 
uh, our email capacity exponentially increased as well. Um, not only was it an operational concern, but anybody who was answering phone, the phones, whether they had anything to do with a specific targeted clinic or not, now had to deal with violent, threatening phone calls that, that were very aggressive. So this started to impact operations substantially. We were activated as a hospital incident command system team uh, when the, the phones and the emails uh, escalated. When we activated, we tried to categorize our concerns into four different areas to try to address as functionally as possible to make sure that hospital operations were maintained. And these are the different categories. So we looked at personal security of our clinicians, um, our clinic security, operational functionality, and then cybersecurity. And I'll go into these different categories. Personal security is was our utmost concern. Um, there were a couple of things that were leaked online, both to the dark web, but also to the not so dark web, which included full names, home addresses, and locations where clinicians worked um, widespread. So this obviously became a significant target for those, uh, for those workers and those um, physicians. We, in the upcoming weeks, there were multiple threats made to these physicians. Um, there were uh, other security issues that happened at their homes as well. And what we did at that point was partner with our security and legal teams. Um, we started to partner with local police agencies. So we're Boston Children's Hospital, but many of our clinicians live in the surrounding areas as well. So helping them understand what was happening. Um, we tried to hide any information that we could about these positions uh, on our website or on social media in general, just so that um, we wouldn't you know, continue to um, put their names out uh, when there was such high levels of media presence about this. Um, we also uh, tried to partner with external agencies that have their names and other personal information. Uh, so Rate My Doc is one of those one of those websites. This is a website where you can go on and see how highly your doctor is is rated. That is an external website. Um, and at that point, the Rate My Doc website were was also, um, being frequented by all of these individuals who were trying to lower the rating of the doctor and leave really um, threatening comments on that as well. So as you can see, we were dealing with not only what the hospital uh, was experiencing, but there's all these different offshoots of um, impacting, you know, these clinicians' lives and also the rep reputation of the hospital as well. The second category that we focused on at the time was dealing with clinic security. So as with really any, any clinic, there's very few places in the hospital that only has one location that they, they are impacting, right? So if, if you come in for a clinic visit, we're gonna have you go to phlebotomy for your labs. We're gonna have you go to radiology for an X-ray. Um, so even though a specific service was being targeted, it was really the entire hospital. Uh, everybody was getting phone calls and emails that were th threatening, but um, as far as a security concern, it really could happen at any place that um, that uh, does patient care. So there were significant security concerns for all clinics and procedural areas. Um, we had all staff really dealing with the significant stress in answering these phone calls and dealing with these irate individuals. Um, so there's a couple of things that we, we did in partnering with security. So there was an increased security presence at all sites, um, substantial uh, increase of, of security presence. This 
includes even when, where uh, patients go into clinics. We had screening at different entrances, which included, you know, you have to show a government issued ID um, and cross check that with appointments that uh, we have on site. The hospital went into restricted access in certain buildings, and, and that continues today um, so that we're funneling people through one entrance. And uh, additionally, we did offer security escorts to cars in different areas of transportation. We're in Boston, so many people use you know, subways and, and other forms of, of uh, transportation. So making sure that people feel comfortable in getting where they need to go when they're leaving, especially if it's at um, an odd time. The third bunk bucket that we looked at was operational functionality. So as you all know, we need to continue to see patients. We need to make sure that anybody calling the system is gonna get to where they need and be able to schedule appointments or talk to their care team. Um, because of the such an increase in phone calls and emails, there were a couple of things that we did system-wide to help capture all of those emails and phone messages in a centralized place to be able to monitor them, but also keep them out of um, personal inboxes. So one thing we did is work with IT on the back end and utilize different keywords to sequester emails to a specific centralized email inbox um, that would take those violent, aggressive, and threatening emails and put them in one area. That email box was then monitored 24 seven to understand if there were any significant threats that needed to be escalated or, um, or you know, have the police contacted. Those emails then were not received to uh, the individuals unless it was a mistake, you know, people used the wrong word for something and then they were forwarded to the care team. But this helps our care team not have to be bombarded with those harassing emails. We did the same thing with phone messages. So if you were on the phone and you're, you know, a front desk individual and you're you are getting bombarded by a harassing or threatening caller. We set up a voicemail box where individuals could forward that, that call and say, I'm forwarding you to a line where you can leave a message. <laughs> and those phone messages were also monitored. With that, we also developed a script for anybody answering phone calls to help um, People have a standardized way of approaching these callers, and it also arms them with something to do when they're in a challenging situation with challenging individuals. Um, so that helped as well, just bring some agency to that front desk staff. And then we did start to offer mental health support to staff in, in, in a staged up way, just based on the amount of stress that everyone was dealing with. Um, during this time. The, the fourth bucket that we dealt with um, with this response had to do with cybersecurity. I do not have to tell this group about the risks of cybersecurity in, in the healthcare environment. Um, like I mentioned before, we've been attacked previously uh, based on a number of different things. So we wanted to make sure that our IT security was involved and integrated into the, the response early. Um, so once we knew that this was going on, we made sure that they were invited to briefings. We made sure that, um, you know, we had uh, a touch point with them to understand if there was an uptick in threats or a need to implement other cybersecurity measures. Um, and then additionally, our legal department worked with consultants to further investigate uh, social media and trends and understanding um, what was happening outside of our institution um, for social media campaigns, because that is a whole other world. Um, and we were trying to understand, you know, 
the threats that were coming in, but also uh, who was posting, how they were getting information, that information as well, which was extremely helpful. So um, the media presence was very substantial as uh, things kind of um, escalated through our social media presence, more and more regular media also got involved. So um, there were many national news stories on, um, on our care here, but also on the threatening messages. Every time there was a large scale, you know, CNN or um, Fox News or whomever um, media campaign, we would see an increase in the threat, the threats that were directed at us. Uh, additionally, we worked very closely with our marketing and communications team throughout this uh, event. We uh, implemented a couple of things with them. So one, we had to shut off a lot of our social media presence because if we are on Instagram or Facebook and, and promoting something like a blood dr drive, right, or um, any fundraising uh, activities, the comments would have been completely overwhelmed by uh, aggressive and threatening comments. Um, so it was determined to shut that off for, for a period of time. We also had a lot of discussions with our C-suite and our marketing and communications team to understand if there was a need to release a statement or not. Um, knowing that really any type of uh, messaging that went out, we would have that that increase in in threats. Um, so that was a conversation that continued. We ended up uh, doing a, uh, a holding statement after a period of time, and that was once again in in collaboration with our marketing and communication as well as uh, many senior leaders. So that is our harassing phone call and email response. I'm gonna go ahead and continue with our bomb threat responses. That started in September of 2022. Um, so a little bit about the bomb threats that came in. Um, we have had, uh, we had 11 bomb threats from 2022. Uh, to the end of 2023, we've had a couple since 2023 as well. Um, they come in from uh, various methods. We've gotten phone calls, we've gotten emails, we've gotten bomb threats through our scheduling app on our external website. Um, we've gotten bomb threats on our ex external website through the comments section. And my least favorite is an email directly to the police and the press, and those emails didn't even include us. So we didn't even know that there was a bomb threat uh, until the police showed up at our hospital. So really these can come in in, in a number of different ways. Uh, there's various levels of information from the caller and the sender. And what we have found is these threats really follow increased media attention, um, either from our our uh, targeted clinic or from political cycles, or if we get into the news about any any type of situation. Um, so we've we've started to anticipate that in uh, in different ways as we plan. I'm gonna specifically talk about our first bomb threat that happened in the summer of 2022. Um, as all of you have uh, a profession in uh, emergency preparedness, I can tell you that this is one of those events where literally everything went wrong. Um, and I hope that everybody learns from this as, as I, that is our goal, right? We just want everybody to learn from any, uh, any type of challenging event. Um, just a little bit of background from our hospital in 2015, through 2018, we actually had a significant series of bomb threats called into our organization. Um, this was through a robo caller. Um, we knew the source of this. Uh, 
we had like 20 during that time frame. So at the time in the summer of 2022, we felt like we had a pretty good standard operating procedure for bomb threat response. A call would come in, we would call, um, the operations center would call the police, the operations center would call our administrator on duty, we'd set up a hospital incident command system, the police would come, the dogs would come, they'd walk the floors, and then they would leave. We would try to um, really make sure that our, our staff knew what was going on, but it was not a disruption in any way, shape, or form. Um, that was our old standard operating procedure, but the world has changed and we are changing with the world. Um, so in 2022, uh, we had a our page operator receive a, a bomb threat at 7.45 PM and immediately Boston police was notified. Um, the, our administrator on duty and emergency management teams were not notified until at least a half an hour to 45 minutes later. So if anybody here has uh, experienced that delay, um, that makes the response so challenging because the police have a three minute response time here in Bo at Boston. Um, and we weren't even aware that there was an issue uh, for 30 to 45 minutes. We finally got on a briefing at um, 8.45, this is an hour into the response. And then we started to, to go through our um, our regular bombing standard operate, or, or bomb threat standard operating procedure. Um, additionally, when the police came on site, they walked right into our ED and they said, the hospital is closed um, for a security issue. Our ED did not know why, obviously, because they received no messaging um, about this particular event. And we, being a pediatric hospital, uh, are really important to keep open for a variety of reasons. We are pediatric transfer center for all of New England. Um, you know, we we really need to stay open unless we physically cannot stay open or there is a substantial issue. Um, we finally got a hold of our security director whose phone was broken, which is why we had not been escalated to within a 45 minute period and uh, tried to understand what was happening at the hospital. At the same time that the police had made a decision to have the hospital go on lockdown, um, which created substantial problems as well as people were uh, had gone just across the street for food, um, meaning parents, you know, are trying to get back to their kids who are inpatient, who, um, you know, were waiting for them and they couldn't come into the hospital. There was uh, a shift change at 7.30, so that was substantial um, disruption as well. People didn't really understand what was happening. And uh, also, when they decided to do the lockdown, um, they only secured one entrance, which was very confusing to people. And there was still a lot of movement. So certain people weren't let in, but things like Grubhub orders or food orders were let in, which isn't uh, the best message as well um, when there is something like a, a bomb threat happening. In general, there was a lot of chaos happening. Uh, the media showed up on site because they had decided to, um, the police had decided to really uh, quarantine a whole area around us. Um, so there was significant media presence. We still hadn't sent out messaging because we weren't sure exactly what was happening. Uh, all in all, very chaotic. Um, the other thing that happened is the police now realizing that sick kids and ambulances were trying to get into the hospital, asked our ED nursing director to take a team of clinicians and bring them a number of blocks away from the hospital to see patients on the side of the street. 
um, which I think uh, everybody understands why that's not a great idea and, and really not allowed. Uh, and luckily we had a really strong um, nursing presence that night that said, we can't, we can't do this. Can we search the cars? Can we search the ambulances? How do we continue patient care? All in all, a complete mess of a night. We finally got the all clear from security. Our uh, and Boston Police, our security did a sweep of all of our buildings. Um, the Boston Police did a sweep of, of the perimeter of the buildings. But in general, just one of those days um, where you're really questioning a lot of your protocols. Um, from that, we had many different uh, debriefs and meetings to understand what needs to be updated, how we can do this better the next time. Uh, here are some of the significant remediation steps that we've completed. So one is the meeting with the police department. Um, we have had a wonderful relationship with Boston police. We still do. I will say we have our relationship has changed through COVID. And this is because we've had a lot of turnover in our hospital. Boston police has had a lot of turnover in their departments. Um, so legal and our security teams started meeting with Boston police leadership. And that really helped solidify um, both protocols, like what our expectations are when the police come on site, what their expectations are for the hospital when they come in site, and also that general understanding of, you know, we need to stay open um, if, as long as we can because we provide this critical service. They have been absolutely amazing to work with, and we've really um, uh, solidified that relationship over the past couple of years. Additionally, we updated our communication strategies. So one thing that happened during that event is there was some questioning about the messaging that we were going to send out. The messaging had been previously approved by legal and our C-suite um, prior to that bomb threat, but there had been some turnover there too. So there was uh, the an opportunity for education of our processes and the fact that we need to send things out as, as quickly as possible when there is a security event and a, a high media presence. One other thing that we identified was trainings with our on-site um, position in charge. That's our coordinator of place, patient placement. Um, the police were asking her many different questions about the institution and, and all of that, um, there was a connection to our, our Hicks briefings at the time, but uh, there wasn't true awareness of what the police and security were asking at the time, so some trainings were needed there. We updated our process for response. We, we make sure that we have a really tight checklist now, not only for my team, but we've shared that with all anybody who would take administrator on duty so that they know exactly the steps that we're gonna take when there is really any security event, um, but specifically a bomb threat. Additionally, we created an operational checklist that's on your slide here. Um, that helps us determine that what the institution is doing operationally based on the information that we currently have. So, so this helps us as an organization before we talk to police or fire to recommend, are we closing buildings? Are we still open? Can the ORs continue? Can the next pr procedure continue? begin? Do we have to evacuate? Are we accepting transfers? Can clinics continue? So we have this checklist that we can go over with, you know, our administrator on duty and our chief medical officer to help inform because any response agency that comes doesn't understand that we're doing a transplant in the OR right now. We can't shut it down. Um, so that helps us inform that conversation. And then strategies for updating executive leadership, we've updated that as well. Um, it's a great day when <laughs> senior leadership 
is informed of a situation that is developing on the news before they get the internal notification. So we've really tried to um, clarify that and, and understand those escalation steps uh, very clearly. And then we updated those, those protocols. Um, now we have better command and control. We have clear communication channels that have been pre-approved and we have that, that connection with the police department, which like I said, is just really important. And our staff now know after going through this <laughs> multiple times, what to expect from us, what communications to expect, what it means, why we can say certain things, um, so, uh, that has helped increase our confidence in our response from our staff, but also have our staff understand, you know, what the situation is and what actions they might need to take. Next, I'm going to go into our protest response. So the, um, harassing phone calls and emails started. And that escalated to the bomb threat response. And then we had a number of large scale protests at our hospital. Um, this initiated by uh, Twitter and X and social media platforms, individuals having large presence um, and saying that they were gonna come to our hospital and protest. Uh, our first protest specifically had one social media personality that had millions of followers and, and he um, posted the date and said, I'm going to be at Boston Children's Hospital on this date. Um, please uh, come join me and, and join in. Um, and a protest was happening. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of challenges with this. Specifically, timeframes were not posted. So we know now that there was also a, you know, Facebook site. And if people emailed him, he would email specific information about that. Um, but when do you set up your command center? When you tell people to, um, you know, start utilizing different protocols if you know the day, but not the time and things keep changing. So that was challenging. We were unsure of groups that would support the individual. So the challenging thing with protests is it's frequently not only just the one group that comes and protests, but all of these different groups that are like-minded that come with this one group and it just exponentially increases the amount of people that might come and protest. Um, and communication is challenging. There's a need to address the situation and let our staff know what's going on, but we don't want more information to go out there in the world and get uh, attention to gain more pr protesters. One thing that we've learned not only through this response, but through other high profile responses is anything we send out to all staff ends up on social media and ends up in the news if it is, you know, juicy enough. So um, it really makes communication a little bit challenging. So for our, um, for our uh, planning for a uh, significant protest, right, we have our key stakeholders here, which includes the police department, hospital security, our hospital incident command system, media relations, our, our C-suite, ambulatory leadership, and legal. Um, we had many different significant concerns, right? So staff, patient, visitor safety, um, the ability for patients to continue to access our hospital main building. Um, we, Boston Children's is in a specific section of Boston. There's not a a lot of space. We are up against literally connected to many different other hospitals in the area. There's not even a huge uh, green space for people to um, linger around. So that that access to our building was a key concern. And then we need to maintain operational access, exits and entrances. And then we have to plan for the, the worst with protests, unless there is 
a public Facebook page or something of that nature, you don't know if it's going to be five people or if it's going to be, you know, 2000 people. Um, so trying to go through different scenarios to say, okay, is there going to be a, a point at which where we cancel appointments? Is there going to be a point at which we have to go into visitor restrictions or not allow people to leave the hospital? What happens if a fight escalates and there's um, violence in different ways? How are we going to respond to that? And then for communications, we decided upon an advisory uh, to staff and with specific information about how, how to access the building. We considered different forms of patient communication, acknowledging the situation. And these were crafted beforehand, approved beforehand, um, but not distributed until we knew that patient care was gonna be disrupted. And then our marketing communication also worked to uh, prepare a, a holding statement for press inquiries. And let's see here. Uh, this is the messaging that we ended up sending out. Um, so at a high level, we decided to inform individuals about the, the protest that was happening, why this was happening, and then specific actions for individuals who are coming in that day. So utilize different, um, different entrances to come in. Don't engage with protesters. Avoid wearing identifiable information outside the hospitals and then uh, contact communications or security with any um, security concerns. So we've had five protests in total. One had up to 200 uh, attendees. As you can see here, we just don't have the space. So the police are um, put up barricades uh, so that the busy road that you see here can, could be uh, accessible. There were not only a number of protesters um, where, you know, this man had asked people to protest, but we also had a significant number of anti-protesters who are coming as well. And as many people are aware, there are professional protesters who come and their whole job is to rabble rouse. Um, and there were some of that as well too. Um, so this really did require a substantial amount of planning and support. Uh, just some best practices here, start planning early, track media attention, partner with police early and pl plan for multiple scenarios. Um, so, our C-suite suite was extremely engaged with this. We even had a live feed from our security cameras um, where the C-suite could come in, get on a Zoom, ask us what was going on uh, to really help that awareness as well. Okay, institution remediation. Um, so we've had a significant number of events happen in, in the last few years. Um, in for all of these different uh, scenarios, we really wanted to make sure that we had sufficient debriefs, right? We're, we're utilizing normal processes for this. We're uh, creating action items, we're closing them out, and we're training on new protocols. So that's our emergency management hat, and that's what we do any day of the week. Uh, the more challenging part is really at an institutional uh, level, supporting the, con the culture. So understanding the mental load, supporting clinicians, supporting patients. We are a pediatric hospital and it is important that everybody comes in here, um, feels safe for whatever role that they are doing. My slides are a little delayed here. Hold on one second. There we go. Um, so there were a couple of things that we did. Uh, one is to understand the needs from impacted clinics. Um, so some of the clinicians who were very visible needed different types of support. Some of the clinicians have been doing this for years. This isn't the first time that they were um, targeted in, in different ways and they 
have systems that are set up and and um, we're very savvy with certain privacy issues. And then some are new to this situation. So understanding the different levels of support uh, was important for the institution. Ancillary roles are also important in understanding the support that's needed. So it's one thing if you are directly related to the targeted areas, um, but it's another thing if you're just answering phones and you have nothing to do with the clinic that is being targeted. Um, so understanding how to address both individuals who had that higher level risk and the organization as a whole was very challenging. We, uh, like I said, had a significant increase in security presence. Um, since then, we've also rolled out mobile panic buttons. Um, there's been leadership rounding, um, which continues, reminders of support through messaging. Uh, we've, senior leadership has also started like coffee carts, free coffee, um, and uh, those types of of soft touches that I do think people really appreciated during this time. Second. Um, the other thing of note, and all of you understand this. <laughs> so 2020 was a big year for everyone. <laughs> um, Right, we we had to go through COVID and then we had to go through Omicron. We've had significant capacity increases over the past two years. Our staff has just been continuously exposed to these huge emergencies. And then on top of that, you know, we've had um, these substantial security threats. So bringing the uh, the awareness of where the staff are at to the C-suite was really important as well to try to um, implement some measures to uh, support staff in different ways, because it did really feel like an onslaught of um, constant, constant stress for our staff, um, implementing different uh, uh, like yoga for, for staff. Like I said, leadership rounding. Um, there's been a lot that the institution has done to try to support the, um, the staff in different ways. Uh, working with patients, we've also put together scripts for when things happen uh, to be able for individuals to talk to patients about what's going on. There have been different bomb threats um, where the police have come in and, and asked buildings to evacuate as well. So making sure that we have uh, accessible areas outside of the building that can be used as temporary shelters as sometimes it can be quite cold here in Boston. And we've used uh, different media services as well to um, reach out to identified patients, right? Because not only were our clinic, clinicians targeted, but some of our patients were targeted as well. And one thing that we've done as a department is really uh, increased our training and exercise around security threats. So we've partnered with security um, where they do 30 minutes of dedicated security training and we do a 30, 30 minute tabletop exercise um, to familiarize individuals with what to do in their area if there is an active shooter. We've done um, a lot of these in the last two years, upwards of 30. Um, so we've really tried to be as ex accessible as possible to any department who's requesting additional security training. And we've done this just, just like anybody develops training, right? We created training objectives, developed training materials, understood how we could um, really go to a bunch of different areas and our satellite sites uh, in a specific way so we could support as many individuals attending that training as possible. And then um, we implemented the training. And this is just feedback, uh, <laughs> especially because we had these, these um, high risk situations we've gotten overwhelmingly positive feedback from, from the in-person, right? 
tabletop and security trainings in the area that people are working at, right? So um, due to COVID, so much of our training and, and exercises are virtual or scaled back and trying to get people in a room together, talking about their concerns, looking at the actual area, does this door open? What would you do in this scenario? You know, what areas close is just really important for staff. And then just a brief summary, if you find yourself in the middle of significant negative media attention, uh, start planning early, right? Because very infrequently does this completely die out in a, in a uh, brief manner. Um, expect disruptions, right? It is so easy to be hundreds of miles away, not have anything to do with an organization and call in a bomb threat. So easy. And so um, because of that, because of that accessibility, it's the response <laughs> is more likely, but it's also more likely that you're gonna get a lot of those if you do have that significant negative media attention. Um, partner with the internal and external organizations quickly, plan for communications, internal and external, and um, do not not underestimate the impact that these threats have on staff members. Um, like I said, we we focused a lot initially on the clinics that were targeted and realized quickly that really the whole organization was dealing with um, the stress of these threats. Um, and then finally, I will say this forever, but be good to yourself, be good to your team and be patient with others because especially with something like this, right? We can't control it. Um, and it's, it's their long responses, they're complex, um, and really anybody in this profession <laughs> probably needs an extra vacation or two. Um, so just be good to yourself and others. And I think that's it. So I can stop for like three minutes of questions if people have that. Five minutes. Thank you so much for that presentation, Mary. And um, so at this time, folks, if you want to unmute your microphone or turn on your video, you can ask a question that way. Otherwise, if you want to pop a question into the chat, that is also an option. Uh, Mary, first of all, thank you. That was outstanding and fascinating. And um really sorry you guys had to go through that. Uh, so do you guys, does Boston Children's or does does Boston have a community-based threat assessment team or did you guys utilize, how did you utilize that? So we do have a threat assessment team. We also have a Boston Regional Intelligence Center. Um, so both of those, we have an on-site investigator through our security department that loops directly into that. Um, and he handled most of the, specifically the bomb threats or the very specific threats um, to okay. individuals. Um, we would work with him. He had an identified liaison. There was a time where uh, we had a dedicated team in Boston looking at this as well. Sure. Uh, because the, the threats were so specific. Right. Okay, thank you. Like we have a question in the chat. Can you explain mobile panic buttons and how they are used? Sure. So um, about a year ago, uh, everyone who is patient care facing or anybody who is uh, on the main campus or close to the main campus were issued mobile panic buttons. So they go right on your ID and they're hmm. little buttons. And anytime that you have a threat, you click the button twice and it will uh, provide a response from security. Um, security has been amazing with this. Uh, we thought when, when this was rolled out that there was gonna be a million you know, responses that were incorrect, but because of the double, uh, the double tap, it really hasn't been, um, we haven't had like a lot of uh, responses that weren't warranted. Awesome. Um, and security said, great, let's do it. It's like a drill, <laughs> you know, if that, if that does happen. Um, so they work anywhere on our main campus facility uh, and we're rolling them out at different satellite sites as well. 
Thanks, Mary. I had that question too. <laughs> and thank you for a great presentation. I have a question and I'm going to jump in because I, I don't think I'm taking anybody else's time for questions. Um, so something that is historical with exercise, and I'm sure you've had this happen in your facility, but not probably anymore, is that it's hard to get people to take a lot of this seriously and it's hard to get people to commit to it and engage and um, even, you know, administration, it costs money to do all these exercises and things like that. So um, for those people that haven't had this happen yet, um, but, you know, the, I think that your story is relevant to just about any community hospital, um, doesn't matter how big or small, because, you know, everything seems to be a controversy in, in some way at this point in <laughs> history. So, um, like, is, are there any, like, keywords that you would have your, your counterparts at other facilities use to help convince people and administration, like, these exercises really are important, because it sounds like, you know, the exercises that you did prior to this, and, and the responses you had prior to this really prepared you for this. So do you have any advice for the, the folks that haven't experienced it, but really want to keep working on it? It's a really good point. So we did um, active shooter series before COVID and the engagement was much more challenging than now, I think, because mm -hmm. not only we've been through this, but the the country is at a totally different spot now, you know, it's just very divisive and, and also clinical care is different, meaning our, the number of, you know, aggressive events that we have just on a day to day, right, is you go to the grocery store, people yell more, <laughs> no, it's just right. not how it goes. Um, so the engagement piece, we really saw people wanting to reach out to us as much as possible. And then what we did is try to work into their schedule as much as possible as well. So um, every all of our exercises are standardized. So that means that anybody on my team can do it because all of the materials are there. Uh, security can run them if possible. We can work with security to, to go through exactly how we do it. Um, we've worked with people to say, okay, you've got a staff meeting at five o'clock in the morning and you only have 40 minutes. Let's do it at that point. Nine times out of 10, they want more. Um, we'll go once and they'll say, can you come back in six months? I want this training. Uh, they, they really just appreciated it. Um, but we tried to make it, we call them quick hits too. Like, We'll go wherever you are. We'll go at whatever time you want us to be there. And we'll fit into any schedule that you have um, to try to, you know, help with that because the bird, it, it is a burden for sure. And the more resources you put into the exercises, the less you're doing for other things, you know, so any templated right. model you can do uh, just helps. So we put a ton of work on developing it and now it just, it just kind of runs itself um, as well. So that helps. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap this up? Going once, going twice. And with that, thanks everyone for being here. Um, just a reminder, there's no webinar in July. We take a little bit of a summer vacation in July every year. So we'll see you back on our webinars in August. Uh, we'll get the recording of this presentation sent out to you um, probably tomorrow afternoon. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. Um, and if you have any questions that you didn't have a chance to ask today or um, that you think of later on, just send Ahab an email and we'll make sure to get those to Mary. Mary, thanks again for such a great presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, multiple times to speak to our audience and share your knowledge and expertise. Thank you. I'm so glad we started with flying spiders and cicadas <laughs> as well. <laughs> There's no better way.